and during this holiday season and everybody's talking about what they don't know anything about <laughs> most of the time or don't know a lot about usually about the Lord Jesus and the reality of him I am so thankful to be a part of a fellowship where Jesus is real to the members and he's not just a little cardboard figure he's not a little story in a book but he's a walking living reality in their everyday lives and that's one thing if you if you don't learn anything else here learn that and take it with you and also that the main thing is to be a servant for Jesus Christ that's the greatest honor the greatest privilege the greatest blessing after you get saved is to learn how to serve and be his hand extended reaching out but you need to touch Jesus and you need to touch him regularly in order to be a blessing when you reach out so some of you are going to be traveling going forth during these next couple of three weeks and as you go forth just ask the father don't go and jump on everybody you meet but ask the father to let him be your Jesus hand extended to somebody and then you listen closely and the Holy Spirit will clue you in when you're right close to that person and you'll just he'll beam you right in and give you an opportunity to share with some hungry very needy person have you noticed that when you walk in the Spirit, when you really walk in tune with the Holy Spirit, He leads you to the very people that are most needy, the ones who need the touch of the Savior so much. And so many times you run right into them. You don't have to go looking for them. You don't have to go pounding on the doors and pounding the pavement to hunt them. Uh, the Lord has ways to bring you in contact with them, and He will. He's looking for yielded vessels. And so concentrate on that. One thing... Uh, was asked to mention, we have Pastor Sullivan's message that was done here in Homewood, um, what was it, two weeks ago now? Has it been two weeks? Uh, how many of you heard that message? Let's see. There's quite a few of you. Well, we have it on video, and the Lord willing, we're going to play it next Sunday afternoon at 4 o'clock. It's less than two hours long, so if we start at 4 o'clock, we'll have plenty of time to, uh, we'll have it down in the basement, I presume. Um, on the large screen and you'll be able to hear that message if you didn't get to hear Pastor Sylvan. I understand he's got some very shocking things to say and it, at, uh, at least you ought to hear it so you'll have something to pray about. You may run out something to pray about and I suspect from what I understand of some of the things he talks about you'll have a lot more to pray about when you hear this. And so uh, Pastor Sylvan, if you're a little vague on who that is, he's the man that they locked out of his church in Nebraska. And uh, by the way, he won a $2.5 million lawsuit against those people. I think they're all out of business now. And uh, they, of course, appealed the thing, but he did win the lawsuit against them. And so that is, that is some help against the decay and the decline that's in our nation. That uh, they, uh, And I think it shook the liberal people across the nation because they never expected one lonely little preacher getting slapped around to attract so much attention and it got nationwide attention and Pastor Sullivan had put him on the trail and he's he's moving into some areas that we've known about for a long time and he's got uh, fortunately he's got a nationwide megaphone that'll listen and so just pray for him and others who have the ear of many people many Christian people because actually the Christian people are the key to this thing turning and changing. There's no doubt about that. Let's go in our Bibles to the 109th Psalm. I thought with all this stepped up activity of the witches that we're hearing about, it would be a good time for us to step up our activity and counterattack. The order of the day, as always, is attack, attack, attack. Don't wait for them to hit you. Hit them first. Amen. The best way to win a war is to be on the offensive. And you can be just as offensive to the witches as you want to be. That's, that's quite permissible. Uh, go after their strongholds, their strengths, the demons that are empowering them, and attack them freely because we certainly have the mandate to do that. In the 109th Psalm, Hold not thy peace, O God of my praise. Well, the, by the way, if you get under a lot of attack, go to the Psalms. The Psalms are a virtual handbook of warfare. And you'll find that uh, the psalmists were very well acquainted with w real spiritual warfare. And it hasn't been understood particularly because it's been explained away and softened down and watered and sugared and 
and sweetened and made lovely. But they were in a war, and they knew about it. And with your understanding of the demonic and spiritual warfare, you should get a great deal more out of the Psalms than anybody else. Hold not thy peace, O God of my, of my praise, for the mouth of the wicked and the mouth of the deceitful are opened against me. That ever happened to you? The mouth of the wicked and the mouth of the deceitful are opened against me? And he says, Lord, don't hold your peace. Don't you cease. They have spoken against me with a lying tongue. Now, you know, some people lie so much until they convince themselves. Did you ever run across somebody like that that told you something and then you uh, talk to them about it later and they just say, I didn't say that? Well, that's known as a compulsive lying spirit. There's some people who lie when the truth will do better. And they're so in the habit of lying, they just lie when the truth will really serve the purpose a lot better. And when you're dealing with lying, you needn't expect any fair treatment whatsoever. And when the mouth of the wicked and the mouth of the deceitful are opened against me, he said, they have spoken against me with a lying tongue. And they have compassed me. That means circled me about, made a complete circle about me. Now, I see some young people not paying attention. I'm going to call your names in about three seconds. You're much too old to be playing tiddlywinks. Now, you better cut it out or pastor's going to play nasty. And I'll stop and stare right straight at you till every person in the house is looking right directly at you. And then I'll recognize you by name. Now that's all the warning you're going to get. Don't you do it again. You've been pulling this for a while. I've let you off and now the fangs are coming out. You cut it out. You're old enough to know better. I don't like it when children control parents. By the way, while I'm being ugly... Don't you let your children control you and tell you when you can come to church and when you can't. You blister their behind and tell them we're coming to church. If you don't like it, honey, we're going to blister your little fanny until you get to where you like it because it's a cool spot when every time you quiet down. Every time you quiet down when we go back in, it gets quiet and you're going to love it. You're just going to love it, love it, love it. Because, you see, children get control spirits in them. And those control spirits will force the parents to stay away from church or stay out of service. Now, we have a nursery back there. I'd suggest you use it to tan their bottoms when they're up. up. We say, well, they're hyper. They'll calm down. You can cool them off. I mean, they'll be glad to cool. You just haven't made it hot enough yet. When they find out the only cool spot in this church building is sitting quietly on the seat, they will get to where they love it in here. When every time they go down those steps out there, it means a red bottom. They will get to where they love it up here. We've got some in here, if you've noticed, when they start out the door, no, no, no. Well, you see, they know what's down there. Nothing funny. No play toys. No fun fun. No happy days are here again. No marshmallows. Blistered bottom weights at the bottom of the stairs, and they don't want that. And you've just got to stay with them. You say, well, they just won't do it. Oh, come on, who's the biggest? If you can't outstubborn them, you need to resign as a parent. They're not going to do it unless you make them do it. They're children. They have demons. You say, well, that's the reason they do it. They have demons. That's right. You've got to teach them not to give in to those stinking things. That it hurts worse to give in than it does not to. Oh, dear. <laughs> there goes the one who knows there's nothing funny at the bottom. I know it seems cruel and brutal and medieval, but it works. Don't tell me about it. We had three that sat on the pew. Mama was on the platform. Papa was on the platform. And all Papa had to do was just do like this. Ask my daughter. She still gets cold chills every time she hears that. She was the oldest, most often into trouble. <laughs> trying hard to hide it and blame it on the other two she learned that from her mother <laughs> well now now that my wife is thoroughly alienated can I come home to visit, have coffee with some of you tonight I don't <laughs> I don't think it would be a hot time in the Whirly's house tonight alright uh, let's go back to the scriptures they compass me about 
with words of hatred. They fought against me without a cause. Words of hatred and without a cause. And here you thought it was unusual for somebody to do you this way. No, it's the usual thing. When demons get in control of people, this is what they do. They have rewarded me evil for good, hatred for my love. Oh, boy. I didn't do anything but help them. Look what they did. But that's, that's the way they work. Now, set thou a wicked man over him, and let Satan stand at his right hand. Now, that's not very loving, is it? But it sounds pretty good. And some of these people, I think some of these people deserve this. Some of these bosses are giving you fits at work. Some of these neighbors that just won't, won't reconcile, won't settle down, and act like a human. They act like a demon all the time. Well, just say, Lord, I've read over here in your word. It says, set thou a wicked man over him and let Satan stand his right hand. When he shall be judged, let him be condemned and let his prayer become sin. Now, that's pretty severe. Now, be sure you qualify on all this other, though, before you launch into this. But I think this is kind of encouraging. Now, some people say that's not very loving. It's not very loving, but it's very effective. It'll put a stop to a lot of foolishness that's going on. And the righteous people are being hit by witchcraft and hit by wicked people and hit by people who should know better, hit by people who are driven by demons. And the only cure for this is to make it hot for them. Just like you make it hot for the little kid's bottom, you can make it hot for big folks by doing spiritual warfare. And uh, let his prayer be sin. Wow. Wow. Well, you know, I think he's talking about psychic prayers. Let his days be few. That means let him die early. Let another take his office. Whew. That's cutting it real close, isn't it? That means if he's just going to keep on acting this way, let's get rid of him. Let his children be fatherless, his wife a widow. Wow. You say, is that in the Bible? Mm Mm-hmm, right here. Verse 7. Verse 8. Verse 9. It gets worse. It just keeps getting worse. Let his children be continually vagabonds and let them beg. Now, you see, it's... The idea is for not to move into the place of a wicked person attacking those without any cause. Notice the ones, the mouth of the wicked and deceitful come against me. They've spoken with lies, compassed me with words of hatred, fought against me without a cause. I haven't done anything to them. They just did this to me. And uh, for my love, they're my adversaries, and I give myself unto prayer. And they've rewarded me evil for good, hatred for my love. Now then for this, this is what they get. Let the children be vagabonds, let them beg. That means they don't, they're not able to support themselves. Let them seek their bread also out of desolate places. That means they're going to be the ones going to have a scrubbing time trying to make a living. Let the extortioner catch all that he has. In other words, let his finances be wiped out. And let the stranger spoil his labor. Let everything he does go up in smoke and be of no avail. Let there be none to extend mercy unto him. You say, well, that's awfully harsh. Yes, but what they were doing was pretty harsh. Are you getting the idea that God does not have much patience with these people who constantly do evil for good and are constantly hacking away and hacking away? And that's why he put this in here, to let him know that God will clean their plow. And when he does, he'll do a good job of it. So no matter what they do to you, just remember, if you knew, uh, you can just stop and say, boy, if you knew what was going to happen to you and your kids, ooh, you wouldn't do it, you wouldn't do it, you wouldn't do it. Now, I have seen this happen to people. I've been in the ministry long enough, and I've had enough idiots 
that decided they would come against the ministry. I've seen this happen to people, these things. I've seen some people end up fatherless and widows. I've seen some people, uh, some horrible things happen to people. I never forget one old lady. She took it in her mind one time to do a good character assassination on me. I'd never done anything to that woman. Never did anything but good to her. And I didn't have to pray this prayer. Or anything. I didn't even know about it at the time. And she backed up one winter night in a flannel nightgown. She backed up to one of these open asbestos back heaters to warm up before she got in bed. And that thing caught on fire. And that old lady fell over on that bed and the bed caught fire. And one of the women who was with her said that was the most awful thing she ever saw. Said that woman was as black as a chunk of coal from the top of her head to the bottom of her feet. Every inch of her body was black from being burned, charred. And she lived, though, between grease sheets screaming for three days and nights. All she'd done was just pick up the cudgel and decide she'd straighten out that young preacher. And she lied. And she had a good time doing it, but she sure paid for it. I know another man about 32, 33 years old, very prosperous businessman. He decided to help put the preacher away. I never done anything to him. Never think anything but good. I'd prayed for his salvation. I'd helped his wife and his kids. And uh, he decided he would do a job on the preacher, and he did. And it wasn't just a little while. He suddenly took ill and had something like the flu. And he was home a couple of days and he just couldn't seem to get well. They took him to the hospital. He died three days later. They never didn't know what killed him. Picture of health. No problems of any kind. Healthy as a horse. Big, strong, strapping fellow. His wife was left a widow. His children fatherless. I saw some others whose daughters became tramps. They were sweet, precious Christians when I was working with them. They were busy witnessing and winning others to Christ. But when their parents took the hatchet on the preacher, the kids went completely berserk, destroyed them. They became harlots on the street. Pitiful. It just doesn't pay to fool around with what you don't know anything about. I've seen people die. One time I had some dear people who decided to take me on another place. I was praying and suddenly I saw a row of caskets in front of me. I blinked my eyes and I was awake. I wasn't asleep. And I looked and I could see into two of them and I saw the chairman of the board of deacons and one of the lead deacons in the next one. And I thought, well, they're not dead. Lie. They're walking around spewing out lies and everything else. And the Lord whispered to me, They're dead in trespasses and sin. They're not born again at all. But they were locked into the Freemasons. And the issue was Freemasonry. And we walloped that thing. You say, Didn't you back up? You bet I didn't. No way. But those men died. They first lost everything, then they died. Left their wives, widows, and so forth. Like I said, I've seen this happen. This to me is not just paper, page, uh, words on a page. These things happen. And it's just better not to do what's listed up above there because you'll get into some trouble that you can't get out of. And it'll hit you and hit your family. Now... <clears throat> I've seen some people wiped out financially, too. I saw a family completely destroyed financially. And they were in well good shape. But it didn't take the Lord but a year or two for them to be penniless. Absolutely destitute. God wiped them out completely. Well, it says, um, 
I've seen some that didn't die very quick. They died slowly and very miserably. Well, let none extend mercy to them. Let there be, uh, uh, let there be any to favor his fatherless children. Neither let there be any father to favor his children. Let his posterity be cut off. And in the generation following, let their name be blotted out. Let his line just be completely extinguished. Let the iniquity of his fathers be remembered with the Lord. And let not the sin of his mother be blotted out. Sins of the fathers come up to absolutely destroy and blight. And let them be before the Lord continually that he may cut off the memory of them from the earth. That's pretty severe stuff. But I ask you again to go back and look and see what they were doing. See, God's not as uh, lily-livered as we are. I mean, he doesn't take it lightly when his little ones are being butchered. We have a tendency, well, you know, you just have to be patient and kind and just give them another chance. There comes a time when the chances are gone. The freebies are over. When grace ends up, judgment starts. And it is true that God is gracious and loving and he lets things run a long, long time before he strikes. But boy, when he strikes, it's without remedy. Now, let's look a little further. Uh, It gets worse. Because that he remembered not to show mercy, but persecuted the poor and needy man, that he might even slay the broken in heart. Oh boy, this... This turkey was really something. Not only did he not show mercy, but he persecuted the poor and the needy man, and he even tried to slay those that were broken in heart. He had no no mercy, no compassion whatsoever. Total selfishness. Total greed. Number one, even I and I alone am the only important person walking the earth. Everybody else is, forget it. As he loved cursing. Oh, they love to put curses on people. So let it come unto him. As he delighteth not in blessing, so let it be far from him. If he doesn't want to bless people, then let it flee from him. Let the curses go back to him that he sent out. And don't you hesitate to send curses back. If somebody's cursing you, or you think they're putting curses on you by psychic praying, trying to force you to do something? Because, Lord, I wish you'd make them do this. I wish you'd make them go there and make them do this and make them stop this. That's psychic praying. Just say, Lord, if I, I break any psychic curses or prayers coming against me and my family, and I command them to go back. And you can even mention specifically who you think it's coming from. You say, well, that's terrible. It won't hurt a thing unless there's some coming that way. You can't send back what isn't there. If nothing's coming from them, they have nothing to fear. If it's coming from them, they're going to get a bundle. A special delivery. And they'll learn not to send out this garbage once they catch it. And one of the things these closet witches up there, and Jack Chicks uh, infiltrated his place. One thing that really put me on guard with them was the fact that they went right straight up the wall screaming about me saying throw the curses back on the witches no 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 no, no. the poor witches need saving I said the poor witches need to quit that I said I've seen the products of witchcraft both here and overseas I've seen people crippled in body and mind and everything else I've seen little children and grown ups both twisted all out of shape because some stupid idiot put witchcraft curses on them They deserve back on themselves what they're sending. And if they send out that kind of stuff, then they need it back on them. If they don't cut it out, it'll get them. And we do not have to... You say, well, it says bless and curse not. That's right. And if you send me a box of rattlesnakes, I'm going to mark return to the sender. I did not order these. And you can take the rattlesnakes. They're not mine. I didn't order them. You sent them. They're yours. 
I'm going to see that you get them back. And that's the same thing here. They send you a nest of rattlesnakes, send it right back to them. And keep in mind, if they didn't send it, it's not going to go anywhere. Hmm? So you don't have to worry about that part. I'll tell you one thing. The witch is going to start stepping cautiously when they start getting a bundle of these things back. The reason they're, sh- they're shooting so full and free right now is because most Christians are so... Na- well, we must bless them. We must bless them. Well, first dump their curses back on their doorstep and then say, Lord, let's uh, send conviction after them. To bring them, convict them of their wickedness and their sin of walking in darkness to help them flee to Jesus. That's the only way they're going to get in hell. You're not blessing them by encouraging them to go ahead and tear up everybody. We tore up a witch coven or two back in the early days. We, we did a lot of wild stuff in the early days. We're really calmed down now. We're not really very, you know, we're kind of moderate now. We used to do all kinds of wild, weird stuff. There was one witch's coven that split and went all to pieces when we sent a dump. We, 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 I really dumped a load on them one night. Well, they dumped a load on one of the gals coming to the church, so I just, we dumped it right back on them. Now, as... Uh, he clothed himself with cursing, like as with a garment. Let it come into his bowels like water, and like oil into his bones. Now, you see, because he clothed himself with cursing, let it come back into in the inside of him. And let it be unto him as the garment which covers him for a girdle wherewith he is girded continually. Let those things wrap around him where he can't shake loose from them. And when he gets tired of this kind of stuff, he'll quit it. And the only way he's going to get any relief from this, these curses coming back is to come to Jesus Christ. Isn't that what he needs to do anyway? Or what she needs to do? You bet. And if they won't come willingly and they're trying to hurt God's people, then why shouldn't they take it on the chin? I think God's people have taken it long enough. Like I said, you're, you go sending curses back to somebody. You say, Lord, if this is a curse coming from so-and-so, I send it back to them. Go back to the sender. If they didn't send it, you can't send back what's not there. So there's no harm done. But like I said, if they did send it, they're going to have a load around their doorstep. Now he said, uh, let this be the reward of mine adversaries from the Lord and of them that speak evil against my soul. Now you wouldn't think the psalmist was very loving describing what all he wants to happen to his enemies, would you? But I tell you what, after you've been under bombardment from people that are tearing you to pieces and wrecking your family, uh, just shooting at will, you'll be willing to shoot back. And if God can't make us fight any other way, he may just let the witches shoot at us until we get mad enough to fight back. And when we fight back, we're going to find out the weapons of our warfare are infinitely stronger than theirs. But you can see how he's infiltrated the church with this sweet, simpering, love, 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 love. And we must be loving, loving, loving. But love can be very stern. Love can insist that there be righteousness. Love isn't just a syrup you pour on the hotcakes. Love is a dynamic attribute of God. And he demands the holiness of God to go with it. Well, he says, uh, let this be the reward of my adversaries in the Lord. See, they made themselves adversaries with the Lord when they came against God's people. They're on the wrong side. I'm sorry. You need to get on the right side if you don't get shot at. If they say, hey, why are you shooting over here? Well, you're on the wrong side of the fence. Get on the side with God's people, going the way God's people are going, and then you won't have any problems. Then all the bullets that are coming are coming from the other side. And you can help throw them back. Well, he said, um, but do this, do thou for me, O God, the Lord, for thy name's sake, because thy mercy is good, deliver thou me. Now he's throwing himself on the mercy of the Lord. He said, Lord, I need help. 
for I am poor and needy. And he wasn't just saying, oh, I'm poor and needy. I'm not really, but I am. You know, some people say I'm poor and needy. They don't any more mean that than anything. They think, well, I'm the greatest. I've got most everything I need, but I might need just a teeny little adjustment here and there. But the psalmist came and said, I'm poor and I'm needy. And my heart is wounded within me. I am gone like the shadow when it declines. Do you ever see the shadow when it declines? Now you see it, now you don't. He said, I just, I just kind of fizzled out. I'm tossed up and down as a locust. My knees are weak through fasting. And my flesh faileth of fatness. Well, none of us have any problem with that, I don't think. But this psalmist has been fasting. He's actually weakened by fasting and praying. I became also a reproach unto them. And when they looked upon me, they shake their heads. Help me, O Lord my God, and save me according to thy, thy mercy. Now, why does he want to be saved? That they may know that this is thy hand, that thou, Lord, has done it. God does many things in order to demonstrate that he's still in charge and he's still on the throne and he will reveal his hand and always ask for God to glorify and lift up himself when you're praying because it's very needy that you do this. Let them curse, but bless thou when they arise. Let them be ashamed, but let thy servant rejoice. Let mine adversaries be clothed with shame. Let them cover themselves with their own confusion as with a mantle. And I will greatly praise the Lord with my mouth. Yea, I will praise him among the multitude. For he shall stand at the right hand of the poor to save him from those that condemn his soul. Well, now if you want to do some praying, you might line it up alongside the Bible here. But just uh, check the beginning verses. Be sure you're, in quali- you're lined up to qualify for these requests to the Lord. I believe it's time to take the kid gloves off and get down to war, don't you? And we're just going to have to call a spade a spade and wickedness, wickedness. And when people are wicked, they're going to have to repent. Our God is going to judge them. That's all. And there's time and space for repentance. And then comes the judgment. And I'll guarantee you this, from long experience, I can tell you once the judgment starts, you're not going to stop it. Once she starts in motion, she's going to grind right to a powder. Those that are caught in it who would refuse to repent them. We don't know how long God gives to repent, so we can just keep on praying. As long as God tells you to pray for somebody, keep praying for them. But you'll notice that when God is about to judge somebody, he pulls all the prayer warriors off the line. All of a sudden, you'll forget to pray for them. It won't even cross your mind to pray for them. And you'll pray for other people, and you and you a couple of weeks ago, you think, gee, I haven't prayed for so-and-so in a long time. That's funny. I used to pray for them every day. I, I, don't, I forgot it. What's happening? If you could only see God, He's pulling the prayer, the people that are doing effective praying, He's pulling them away because the axe is about to fall. And one of the most dangerous symptoms is when the people who are the most powerful prayer warriors praying for an individual, when God suddenly pulls them off the prayer line. I've actually gotten down at times. I used to have a when I was going to seminary, I had a whole list of people, my whole church membership, and some other people besides. And I used to go down that list and pray for specific individuals every day. And I got to, that way you don't forget them, you see. And I'd go down there and then I noticed one day that I started to pray for somebody and the words just came out, you know, and I backed up and I thought, gee, I didn't do a very good job praying for them. Now, Lord, and I tried to pray for them again. The Lord said, would you hush? I don't want you to pray for them. But Lord, they, they're in need. I know they're in need. But I don't want you praying for them. And I learned by experience that what's fixing to happen 
he wants you out of the way because he's fixing to swap that mosquito. And he doesn't want any of his people involved and he wants you to pull back out of the way. So don't feel bad if you suddenly don't feel like praying for somebody and you've been praying for them a long time. Ask the Lord, Am I, is there something wrong with me? If he doesn't tell you, just let it go. Because all that's happening is he's pulling the prayer support away from those people because he's about ready to move into the judgment phase. Our God is a God of justice as well as love and grace. And if you won't have love and grace, if you do despite to love and grace, the only thing left for you then is justice. Do you want the justice of God? Hmm? You want what you deserve? Would you like to have what you deserve? Think about it a minute. Some of you look a little uncomfortable. I don't know whether I do or not. No, not really. I want God's mercy and his grace. I'll just tell you frankly. And if you keep yourself in that attitude and you keep moving in that direction, no matter how many blunders you pull, no matter any flaws in your life, if you honestly are trying to move back to the Lord and get close to the Lord, that's fine. But you see, the people this psalmist is praying about have hardened their heart repeatedly. And let me warn you, the same sunlight can hit a lump of clay and a lump of wax. The lump of clay will get harder by the hour. The wax will melt and get softer. Sometimes when God moves, some people just melt and they repent and they come back to the Lord. Others harder. Read the account with Pharaoh, for example. When God started to move on the judgments on Pharaoh, the ju ten judgments against, ten plagues against Egypt, at first it said that Pharaoh hardened his heart first two or three times and said, no, I won't let the people go. But then it changes, and from the, either the third or fourth time, it starts and it says, and God hardened Pharaoh's heart. See, he had passed over the line. He could have, up to that point, he could have repented and gotten mercy for himself and his household. I'm sure of that. He could have said, all right, I've been wrong. I'll let the people go. And Egypt would have been spared judgment. But he didn't do it. He hardened his heart and said, no, I won't let them go. No, I won't let them go. And I can't remember whether it was the third or fourth time, I believe it was, that the changes in the Bible specifically says, and God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Up to then it said Pharaoh hardened his heart. And you see, there's a time when God calls on people to repent. They say, no. Not, or they do like Pharaoh and say, yeah, yeah, I guess I will. Yeah, I will. No, I changed my mind. I'm not going to do it. Well, that's not repentance, you see. And then there comes a time when the doors are closed and mercy's gates close. And from then on, God hardens their heart and the tests keep coming and they can't change. And they can't turn because they're headed right straight into the grinder. And God is going to teach them the folly of defying his will. Well, that gives us some solemn things to think about, doesn't it? Aren't you glad you're not in the grinder? Hmm? Aren't you glad if you're heading that way you can get out? Don't be a fool. Don't harden your heart. When God starts dealing with you, melt. Don't lump. Because I'll guarantee you there's no lump God can't break. But rather, give in to the Lord and repent and make peace quickly with the Lord and get your life straightened out and keep it that way because God is ever moving to bring us closer to himself. He doesn't want us to be caught in the devil's tools. He doesn't want us to be caught, caught in rock music and out in the world drinking and <coughs> running around with the crowd. <coughs> he doesn't want any of that for us. He has far better things for us. But if you won't have his best, then you'll have to take the other. And while love and grace is working, that's a good time to keep your heart straight with the Lord. That's why we've opened the doors of the church several times in recent months, just to let you have a chance to take care of those things. 
because there was an urgency. The Lord was saying, there are some things that have to be made right and now. And praise the Lord. Aren't you glad that the door of mercy is open? Aren't you glad your heart is still able to be touched? And uh, sometimes, you know, you feel like, oh, I just feel so convicted all the time, you know. Well, that could be a blessing, you know, the fact that you're sensitive to what the Holy Spirit's saying. Aren't you glad you're not calloused and you don't feel anything wrong with me? But really inside you, you're, you're constantly dealing with these things. You think, Lord, I'm just not where I ought to be. Lord, I need to be better. I need to be closer. See, those are all indications. And then when you put it in action, it proves something's working in you. It's the grace of God. Praise the Lord. If you've never asked Jesus in your heart, you're not sure you have, wouldn't you like to tonight? He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in. If you've never done this or you're not sure you have, then by all means, let's do it tonight. Get it settled. If that's not your problem, but you're driven, you're harassed, you're tormented, and this is producing compulsive behavior, this is demonic activity, and you need to be freed by being cast out, demons cast out of you. These signs shall follow them that believe in my name, so they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues, lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. We believe in this whole thing. And we have workers here who can help you if you're visiting with us. And uh, we urge you to take advantage of the fact you're in a place where the, we're about to change now into body ministry. We've had pulpit ministry. Now we're going to go into body ministry where the whole body begins to minister one to another. And so if you have a need, don't hesitate to come and seek help in Jesus' name. Let's stand and sing something about that name. Now, as we do, if you have a need, come on down the aisle. If you happen to be a first-time visitor coming for prayer, cut the line, come straight down the middle so that you'll get the help first.